Okay, so um, Bible days, you know, we go from we go from uh, this this whole primitive thought that the, the gods are angry and gods and goddesses and moon and stars are you know always on the verge of making our life a mess. Jesus comes, amazing, we celebrate his life, his death, his resurrection. Then churches are started. To try and teach this new way of looking at God, that God is not a mean, angry God who wants to ruin your life if you just get on his wrong side. God's a God of relationship. But still, the whole world is still messed up in this whole idea that the gods are angry. Still very much in this whole thought, and I've got to do more and more and more to somehow please them and keep them happy, because if not, my life's going to be a mess. Bad. In the Bible, uh, God is always represented as light. Right from the very beginning. And then Jesus comes to this earth and he is called the what? The light of the world. So in the Bible, especially in this book called Revelation, which is different. It's very filled with... You would think I planned that. Did I do something? You have got to be kidding me. Let's give you something to write about on Facebook. <laughs> Tell them about our church and the things that I do that don't always work. <clears throat> Imagine those two candles are lit. <laughs> That's not that hard to do. Uh, yes. Imagine that these three candles are lit. <laughs> Maybe I don't understand how these things work. I've never been on this side of weddings. Usually I just read the ceremony and these are like some of you ladies are like, if he only knew how to work wedding candles. I like this one. <laughs> All right, so churches are represented as candlesticks that are supposed to have light and not go out. Now, there were seven churches in... Uh, Asia Minor, and you can see them listed there, and uh, what the, one of the most prominent leaders at, at this time, uh, we're talking like 70 AD, one of the most prominent leaders uh, at this time was a, a man named John, and John was... Uh, made to go to this lonely island called Patmos, which is uh, just above, the, just beside the number seven, if you can see that there, because the Romans were worried about the Christians and, and their movement overtaking the world, which it did. But they were worried about this, so they figured that if they could get rid of one of their key leaders by shutting him up in this deserted island called Patmos, then, you know, their life would be better. But the thing is that while he was on this island called Patmos, he gets a vision from Christ. It's this, this vision where he knew that Christ was talking to him. And in this vision, he was saying, among other things, I want you to write a letter to these seven churches, and I want you to let them know how they're doing from me. 
Now imagine if next week, you know, we said there's going to be a letter written here next week and read publicly, and it's from Jesus. And Jesus is going to let us know how we're doing as a congregation, both good and bad. Like, would you want to show up or sleep in that day? I, you know, that would be, that would be, I don't know, wonderfully scary. A letter from Jesus. So, so in these letters, there's, there's different symbolisms that, you know, Revelation is, is full of symbols. That, but in the letters, uh, there's a, a messenger represented. And this messenger must have been the, the person in each church who was designated to read the letter to the church. And then um, in these letters to the churches, there's the symbolism of seven stars. And the seven stars, I think, were the pastor of each congregation in which Jesus says, I want you to know, pastors, I hold you in my right hand. And in Bible days, right hand always meant strength because most people are right-handed and their strong hand is their right hand. And did you know that in Bible days, parents force their kids to be right-handed? And so when the Bible says, especially in the, what we call the Old Testament, when it talks about the right hand of God, it just means the strength of God. So there's a messenger in each church who reads this letter. There are the seven stars who I think are like the leaders of each church that Jesus says, I hold in my strong right hand. And Jesus says, and I walk through every church every day. You know, the lamp stands. And here's, by the way, how that verse reads. In Revelation 2.1, this is the opening comments to a church in Ephesus in Asia Minor. So it says to the angel, this is probably the messenger, it's a literally translated messenger, to the messenger of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him, that's Jesus, these are the words of Jesus who holds the leaders, the seven stars in his mighty right hand, and he walks among the seven golden lampstands, which had this been a fully working illustration, these would all be lit, and you'd be able to go, oh, I see, I see the lights on every candle represent the seven churches. I wonder, I wonder what it would be like if we really realized or thought that Jesus walks amongst us every week, every day, but that Jesus is here right now, laughing at me and the candles and so the first letter is to a church in Ephesus thousands of people from all over the world come to this ancient city of Ephesus they come to view the spectacular relics to buy t-shirts for their grandkids and little images to the goddess Artemis who was worshipped here 2,000 years ago but 2,000 years ago, people came to Ephesus for a whole different reason. From every corner of the globe, people came because this was a world-class city. It's like our New York or Singapore, Paris or Beijing. It was the center of the cult worship to Artemis. Pilgrims came to this massive temple that was one of the seven wonders of the world. And in this city, there was a group of followers of Jesus Christ. This church planted here thrived in the midst of this pagan environment. Headliners like Paul were here for two and a half years, the Apostle John and Timothy. And interestingly enough, the letters that Jesus wrote to the churches of Asia Minor, the very first letter he wrote was a letter to this church in the city of Ephesus. Now, starting a church anywhere is always difficult, but Ephesus was a really tough place to start a church. But God decided, hey, let's start a church in Ephesus. <clears throat> but you could easily say, but um, that's going to be a hard thing because there's something called Caesar worship that's really prominent in Ephesus, and there is one of those goddesses, 
Her name is Artemis, sometimes called Diana, but Artemis. And she is worshipped there. She's got a temple there that they've made that's the size of a soccer field. It's an amazing thing. And it was called, it was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. It was, it was just a place of beauty. And people would come from all over the place to worship a goddess named Artemis. So if you're going to start a church, let's start a church somewhere else where there isn't all of this competition. By this time in Roman history, the Caesars insisted that they were God. They were divine. They were God on earth. And they insisted that they be worshipped, which was a very difficult thing for Christians. Because Christians didn't believe that Caesar was God. Christians believed that God was God. Uh, the Caesars made it even more difficult. There was a place in Ephesus in particular that was called the Agora, A-G-O-R-A, which was an open-air market. And this marketplace was where life happened in this town of Ephesus. It's where you would go to buy anything from food to clothing to pottery to uh, places for your, your home to crafts to anything. And if you had to sell something, crops or whatever, you would, you would go to the Agora. If you made things, you would go to the Agora. So if you wanted to, to earn a living or buy things for your family, it happened in the Agora. The thing was, though, that the Caesars said, if you were to go into this Agora, you had to worship Caesar. And you had to take a piece of incense and burn it in the name of Caesar. And thus you were saying, Caesar is Lord. Caesar is God. And if you don't do that, not only will you be looked at as an enemy on the state of the state, you will be held in suspicion, but you cannot buy goods for your family, nor can you sell goods for your family. And this is a tough place to start a church. Let's start a church of of people who are Christians that can't be part of the community. Well, how's that going to work? Oh, and then Artemis. Wow. You know, this whole system of belief that we're talking about since primitive times where people believe that you've got to do enough to please the gods and the goddesses. Well, Artemis is among the worst and most disgusting of all mythological characters in the Roman, you know, mythology scheme of things. Uh, not to get too graphic, but Artemis was believed to be the goddess of fertility. So if you wanted to have a child, you would have to worship goddess. You would have to do enough to make Artemis happy. And if you wanted to have a healthy child... Later on, you, had, you, can't, you continue to have to make Artemis happy. You had to do more and more and more. There's even instances of people sacrificing their own child to Artemis because it, or to these gods. Because if you do that, then you assure yourself maybe that the rest of your kids will be healthy. You've got to do more and more and more. But she was the goddess of fertility, and the way that you worshipped her, and this is where I don't want to get too graphic, was through sexuality. And so there were male and female prostitutes as part of the religion of pleasing Artemis. There was also bestiality. To make matters worse, it was believed that in order... To get Artemis's attention, the thing that really caused this goddess Artemis to, to notice who you were and to do things that you wanted was through sorcery. And so there were all sorts of, of, of these witches and warlocks and magicians who did sorcery and voodoo and all sorts of things 
to, to try to get Artemis to do good things for the people. So you've got this, all of this weird religious stuff going on in this place where we're supposed to start a church. You have worship of a, a man who is like the, the, the biggest authority in the area. Then you've got this weird mixture of this worship of the goddess of Artemis that then involves all, of the, all of this prostitution in the name of this goddess, plus this mixture of, of voodoo and witches and warlocks and all of this going on. These are the kinds of spectacular ruins that tourists come from all over the world to see. But for early Christians walking through this plaza, this was the library, one of the greatest libraries in the world, reminding them that they were in an intellectual center. As they would walk through these archways, they would see over the top the inscription to Caesar Augustus, who is God? And it would remind them of the worship of the emperors that created so much tension in their lives. Just over here is the town brothel right out in the public, which would again, remind them of the seduction of the rampant sexual immorality in Ephesus. But through those arches is where the action really happened. The town market, the Agora. The Agora was the most important trade center in Ephesus. It was in the form of a large square surrounded by columns with three gates. I've entered through the gate from the Celsus Library Three sides of the Agora were surrounded by a portico that held the shops doing business in this commercial center. Now the Agora is what I described earlier, this open air market, which was everything that was good about Ephesus combined with everything that was bad all at once. Because, first off, the Christians were not allowed to enter this place, so the influence of God would not have been in this place. Secondly, if you're trying to find people that represent Artemis, the witches and warlocks and the people that do voodoo and all of that, that somehow will stir Artemis to do things in your favor, this would be a good place to find them in the Agora. They were kind of like her representatives, her ministers, so to speak. Now, Acts chapter 19 is an unusual uh, section of Scripture that talks about uh, the beginnings of this church in Ephesus. And it says that a man, a very... Uh, amazing man of God named Paul came and he began to speak in this town called Ephesus, this weird religious mixture, Ephesus, that happened to have a Jewish synagogue. And with great courage, he entered into this Jewish synagogue and began to teach about Jesus. This whole idea that there is a God who comes and it's not about more and it's not about enough. Enough, it's about relationship. He begins to teach about Jesus and Acts actually says that people not only started to listen, but they started to actually give their heart to God through these messages. And it specifically says that it was God Jews and Greeks. This is a phenomenal happening because Jewish people who didn't really want to believe, you know, in the name of Jesus were believing in the name of Jesus and Greeks who were raised under this whole idea of doing enough and these gods and goddesses, they are coming to Jesus and making the start of a church in Ephesus, which in and of itself presents some problems. This is from the Jewish uh, uh, library online that says, The Jews bitterly resented the Greeks. They were more foreign and wildly offensive than any group that there'd ever been. And God says, but let's start a church. 
<laughs> we're going to start a church here. Not only are we going to start a church in this weird religious environment with, with Caesar worship and Artemis worship and all that goes along with that, but we're going to start a church, and the very first people in this church are going to be people that have never got along before. People that actually hate one another. The Jewish people pretty much hated the Greeks. And the Greeks didn't like them either. Areas of offense, including clothing. The, the Jews didn't like the way the Greeks dressed. Um, they dressed too worldly for the Jews. And you know, the Greeks didn't like the way the Jewish people dressed. And... Uh, there was something called circumcision. We talked about this uh, three or four weeks ago. And um, circumcision was a way when God's people were first started, you know, back in the time of Abraham. And it was a way, a, a beautiful symbolism of God to say, um, to, to give the Hebrew people's identity. This is, this is something that all of the Hebrews will do. It kind of... Uh, makes you one of us. It is, a, it is a wonderful Hebrew thing that we're doing. It, plus, there was beautiful symbolism in it that, that I, I'm not going to get into now. But what happened was that the Jews then would say, anybody else that wants to become a Christian has to go through this, circum this circumcision. But the Greeks, who were, who were by this time adult males, are saying, but we're not going to do this. We consider this mutilation of the body, which is totally against anything that we believe in. And there was and this was a huge deal to the Greeks and the Jews and they argued over this. And God says, "We're going to start a church with people that don't like the way one another dresses and they kind of lift their nose up at one another and this whole idea of circumcision where the Jews feel like they're better believers than someone else because and they argued over diet rules and they argued over holidays what what Holidays should be uh, celebrated and so forth. They argued. In fact, there was, there's a whole bigger list that I could do, but I didn't have enough room on this slide nor time to talk about it. So God says, let's start a church with people who don't really get along. Now, part of this background in, um, in Acts chapter 19 also goes on to say, there were these Jews and these Greeks who started to believe in Jesus, and they, they're starting to believe and to kind of form a group of believers, which was an amazing thing to think that they would be willing to put all of this stuff that was really minor compared to Jesus. They would be willing to stop judging one another for all of these things because the bigger cause was that there's a God who loves them and there's a God who doesn't any longer demand more and enough and it, let's just stop turning our nose about, about, about the way people dress and so forth. And then the Bible goes on to say something else very incredible happened among a group that you'd never believe would ever come to Jesus. You know those witches and warlocks? Scripture says that there were people, an unusual amount of people in Ephesus, and you, it's easy to understand, that were, had demon possession. And there were people that were starting to be freed of these demons because the name of Jesus was being spoken and Jesus was being prayed into their life. And the witches and the warlocks began to take notice of this. And Acts 19 says that one day these witches and warlocks decided to come to Jesus. And they came out into a, a public place and they burnt all of their scrolls that had the incantations and the teachings and all of this voodoo stuff in it. Basically, their, you know, their holy books. They burnt those in a big pile and consumed all of them. And they were saying, we're going to come to Jesus and we're going to give all of our past to him. We're going to come and give them everything. And somebody's always counting. And so they said there was like 50,000 pieces of silver worth of, of all of these, these scrolls, which would be over a million dollars. It was a huge happening. And the early church starts out of this craziness. 
the early church starts out of Jews and Greeks who formerly never got along, and God brings them together. And then through this unusual circumstance of witches and warlocks coming together and saying, we're going to just give our old life to Jesus and throw all of that away, and they burn publicly all of these scrolls in this huge fire. And throughout all of that, a church was started. Now imagine what their worship services would be like. You come to a worship service, and you're a Jew, and you're sitting by a Greek whose outfits you don't really approve of. And you're a, you're a Greek, and you're looking at a, a Jewish person who uh, traditionally has never, ever seen life the way you do or get along with you at all. In fact, they've made you feel inferior, and they're part of your church now. And you look around in a worship environment, and there's a witch or a warlock that was just at a, a fire, you know, scroll burning not too long ago, and they're there too. And, and you look around, and there's like, there's like a prostitute who is a prostitute for Artemis who's there because she's given her life to God. And none of them really know much about anything except that there is a God now who loves them and doesn't insist on them earning his favor. But there's a God who accepts them and forgives them. And it's this conglomeration of Jews and Greeks who don't get along and witches and warlocks and all of this combined to start a church. Scary, but wonderful, all at the same time. And this is how this church in Ephesus gets started. That was a background, and I'm going to just give you a few more minutes worth of teaching now. Because now fast forward about 20 years after the bonfire... Fast forward about 20, 30 years after this incredible start of a church where you combine people that never have got along before, people that always judge one another based over clothing and, and other things and just uh, you, witches and warlocks and all this stuff, starting this incredible church and it's all about Jesus and it's not about all these differences that we have and, and all of these biases and all of these prejudices that we have one, uh, against one another. It's just simply about a God who loves us and we love Him. And if there's things that need to be changed in our life, He will change us. But we're not going to keep judging people and we're not going to be somebody's life coach and insist that they change this about their clothes. We're just going to love Jesus and let Jesus work with us and them so fast forward about 20, 30 years from that, and we get this letter that says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. This is really great news for, the, for the, the people in Ephesus because Jesus at the beginning here is just saying, I know what you do. I know all of the work that you've done. I know that you persevere. I know that you cannot tolerate people who come in and start teaching something other than Jesus and want to take leadership. I know that you will not let that happen. I know that, that week in and week out you insist that God's word is taught. I, I know that. I, I know your deeds. I know how hard you've been working. And you have persevered. You have endured hardships. It's not easy to be a Christian in Ephesus. I know this. You've endured hardships for my name. And you have not grown weary. I know these good things. I know your work your perseverance. You've not allowed false teachers to take root in, in your group and you have not given up. But 
then the letter goes on and it says, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. You've left your first love. Wait a minute, Jesus. I thought you said that we're a church that works hard. You can count on us. There's not a church that works any harder. I thought you said that every Sunday we insist that God's word is spoken. And I thought you said that we, you know, we persevere under all of this hardship. And I thought that was a good thing. It is a good thing unless it becomes the way that you try to work yourself into God's favor. Unless those early days, you remember when you were at the bonfire and you were watching these witches and these warhawks as they were, they were burning their scrolls and you remember how it felt when, when, when these, these prostitutes came to know Jesus and you just remember how beautiful it was and how much you loved Jesus and you remember how much you just wanted to, to get into to, to to the word of God and to just grow spiritually and, and just be able to worship him. Do you remember those days that you just first were so in love with Jesus? Do you remember what that was like in your church? It was very unpredictable. It was kind of scary because you weren't quite sure who was going to show up, but it was wonderful and it was good and it was fresh and it was new. But now I don't see that anymore, 20 or 30 years later. Do you know what it seems like? really makes you feel like you're doing so well is that you just work hard. You work hard. I mean, I'm happy that you do these deeds. You work hard. You're there. You make sure that every, you know, every ministry's fully done and you're there every week and, and you make sure that, that the, the belief system that, that, that uh, of scripture is, is held and you make sure that whoever's preaching is right on cue and all of that and you do all of your religious things but it somehow is turned back into this whole thing of more and enough because it's not a love relationship anymore you've traded that for doing things that make you feel spiritual Make you feel like you're so close to God because you dress better than other people now. You, you, you live a different life morally speaking. You work, you persevere, but that's become your thing. And not loving me. And so he goes on and he says, I, I want you to consider how far you've fallen. I mean, since that bonfire and since those early days and since those days where you sat the first times with a, with a Greek person or, or the Greeks with Jewish people and you felt that tension, but yet you were willing to say it's okay because there's a bigger reason that we're here together and it's about Jesus and they're not perfect and neither am I. And if it wasn't for the grace of Jesus, I'd never be able to be here anyway. Do you remember those times where you just sat together in worship and all of the little things that people disagree about and fight over and turn their nose up? And it's just not important. Do you remember those days? Repent. Maybe have another bonfire. I don't know. Repent. Because if you don't, oh, I've got one candle left. You know, churches die. And they die for a lot of different reasons. But you ever stop to think that churches sometimes die because Christ just decides to not be there anymore. They go on for a while. They go on with their activities. They, they do their different ministries. They make sure that, you know, that someone speaks just right on Sunday mornings. They work hard. They're always there. 
They dress super appropriately. They do all of this stuff. But that's kind of their whole experience with God is just doing the stuff. Doing the stuff. And God says, you don't really love me anymore. You love the stuff that you do that makes you feel like you're a Christian. And he goes on. We're not going to we're not going to read through it, but I have listed some passages in your the outline today that just that you can just look at at another time. These were written as a pre-warning to the Ephesians. These were ways that these people had problems loving one another. Because what I think happened was that they got back to this judging one another. I believe that the Greeks started to judge the Gentiles, and the, or the Greeks started to judge the Jews, and the Jews the Greeks, and, and the prostitutes, and all of that started to just, instead of just saying, God has brought us all together, let's work together as one, they started to fight with one another and make that the thing that they did instead of loving Jesus. And you can see that. In Ephesians, and so today there is no church in Ephesus because they just couldn't replace that love. Instead, they loved to just judge one another, fight with one another, get back to the old ways that really are no more than just trying to do enough and to please the God by all of their actions and judging everyone else who doesn't measure up. Would you bow your heads together with me? Our Father, this is, this is really a hard lesson to learn because while on one hand we say we are so glad that we came to God in grace and that God does not make me earn his love. While we say that, we so quickly turn right around and get right back into that and somehow think that it's really not about a love relationship, but it's doing all the things. And it gets right back into this idea of enough and more instead of just the basic relationship with you, which then leads us to start judging other people who do not do enough and who do not do more in the same way that we do. And that starts a vicious circle, and then one day you say, I've really had enough, because it's not about me. It's about all your stuff that makes you feel like you're a Christian it really isn't as important as a love with me. Challenge us, Lord, in a moment of personal reflection to be reminded that it is about grace, not the works that we get right back into. Help us, Lord, to reflect. Are, there, do, are we more in love with the things that make us feel like a Christian than we are with you? Are we more in love with the activities that we do than we are with you? Challenge us, God. Challenge our heart today.